Well, while that's opening, I'll, uh, the, f- the first speaker is um, God School Professor of Plant Biology and Crop Sciences, uh, Steve Long. Uh, he's also a Fellow of the Royal Society, and uh, today he's going to be talking about can we have sufficient food and feed for 2050 while still expanding biofuels. Okay, well, my uh, thanks to Evan and the organising committee for this opportunity to present to you. This is interesting. Um, so, as Andrew said, I want to really talk to you about the issue of food feed for 2050. And, of course, the issue of, of bioenergy and whether, whether we can have both, essentially. And I hope I'm going to convince you that we can indeed do both if we take advantage of the opportunities that we have. Um, just to step back a little, there are of course many sustainability institutes around the country, most of them positioned on the coast in California, New York, Washington DC and so on. But I think one of the things that really distinguishes us is our capability to, as Evan said, you know, as Evan has designed in this, that we can be actionable. So. We can not only deal with the theory side, but we can put it into practice. And having been involved with global change issues for 30 years of my life, I must admit I'm getting tired of seeing model predictions without people now telling us, okay, what are some of the solutions that are actionable? And so I just wanted to step back and give you some view as to why Illinois is so well placed in this area. This is our Institute for Genomic Biology. And what you see in front of this is the Morrow Plots. This is the oldest sustainability experiment in the world outside of of Britain, in fact, um, where corn has been grown since 1876 continuously (laughs) under various soil treatments to really see what can actually be sustained. Illinois is unusual in having this link from, um, if you like, frontline genomics right through to very practical crop production. And just to emphasize you know, where we are, this is um, Mary Dell Clinton and Rob Fraley, the winners of the World Food Prize last year. Um, they're both alums of the University of, of Illinois, the founder of Syngenta and the chief executive of, of Monsanto. And they, they were awarded the World Food Prize for their contribution to crop biotechnology. Um, so Illinois is also unusual in going from, right adjacent to us we have six square miles of experimental farm, and yet we also have on campus the world's largest, most powerful public domain computer. In, in blue waters. And what we're able to do here is to combine those, those resources in quite a unique way. And as I move into my own topic, which is photosynthesis, which has been an area where Illinois has been a leader for over 50 years, um, let's point out that, for example, what we see is the last major overarching discovery in photosynthesis was made just a few hundred yards from here by by these gentlemen. Uh, The last one there, Chris Somerville, is actually on campus today where they discovered the process of photorespiration, which has a huge effect on the sustainability of many of our our crops. Um, I say the last major discovery what we've now done over since that time, that discovery was made in 1970, is really been putting all of the details into place. And I'll try and present some of that in my talk. So I've divided the talk into three parts. The last is very short. Um, addressing food security under global change. What can we do from a technological perspective? Bioenergy without Um, conflict with food production, is that possible in this country? And barriers beyond science and technology, which are going to be brief. So if we look at um, primary foodstuff production in the world, these are the four top crops. So 
these, these, this is what was produced in 2012. Uh, maize is number one. Um, wheat and rice come a close second, and then soy comes fourth. So these are what we call our primary foodstuffs. Should mention that the United States contribution to this is larger than any other country. Um, it produces over a third of the world's maize, even though it does it on 10% of the land used for that crop. And it produces a third of the world's soy as well, nearly 10% of the world's wheat too, a small, very small proportion of rice. And it is the biggest exporter of primary foodstuffs in the world. In fact, it still exports more than all other countries combined uh, together, although Brazil's exports are, are rising rapidly. But last year we exported 100, 110 million tons of primary foodstuffs. Um, Brazil exported 40 million tons, to put it in perspective. They were the second largest exporter. So really what happens to the US system impacts the whole world because if you took that away, it would completely disrupt the world's a global food and feed supply system. Now, the problem we're up against is that many organizations estimate that by 2050, we need 70% more of these crops than we have today. Some NGOs say FAO is underestimating this. The figure is closer to 100%. This is the reason why. Um, so if we look at um, the solid, solid blue line on this figure, this is if we continue to improve rice as we have over the last 50 years, this is how rice yields per hectare will increase. But the dotted line shows what demand is projected to be because of increased population, changing diets, urbanization, particularly in China and India, this demand will rise considerably more than we think we can improve supply. And so what we're already seeing this unfold, that demand is, has for the last few years been increasing faster than demand. The result of this has been, for example, if you look at wheat prices, in 07, about $130 per tonne. By 2013, $360 per tonne. And it's estimated that under the present situation, every seven years we're going to see a doubling of the cost of primary foodstuffs. That we may not see much impact in this country or generally in the developed world for some time. But in many countries of the world, 60% of in household income goes on food. So a doubling has a huge impact in those communities. The problem, though, is actually worse than this. Um, we are not managing to maintain the historical rate of improvement. So if you look at the solid line on this graph for wheat, what that shows is that during the years of the Green Revolution, 19 the decades of the Green Revolution, the 70s, the 80s, we were increasing yield per hectare by 30% per decade. In the first decade of this century, the increase globally was zero. And I should add in this, there isn't a huge amount of extra land available. So what we're really dependent on is getting more yield per unit land area. In fact, some NGOs actually estimate the land available for these crops is going to decrease, both because of urbanization, um, failure of water supplies for irrigation, and so on. So the key here is to get more yield per unit land area. Um, I just also point out that this is getting harder and harder to get. If you look at the, the pink on this graph, this shows yield increases per decade um, that have been achieved with rice. And again, you can see in the Green Revolution years, China was managing about 30% per decade. In the first decade of this century, that was down to 4%. Yet, the investment that China is making in improving rice yields 
is four orders of magnitude higher than it was in the 70s. So what this tells us is it's getting much harder to get these yield increases. So why might that be? If we look at from first principles, what determines the yield of a crop? So if you grow a crop at a site and you protect it from um, abiotic stresses, i.e. it has the nutrients and water it needs, you protect it from pests and diseases, what in the genetics determines the yield that will be achieved at that given site? So it's determined by the amount of solar energy that is available to the crop over the growing season. How efficient the crop is at capturing that sunlight. And then how efficient it is at converting that captured sunlight into biomass. And finally, how efficient is it at transferring that biomass into the part of the crop that we care about. So the grain of the wheat, the seed of soybean, and so on. Now, if we look at what we think the maxima are versus the achieved, this is for a soybean crop growing on our south farm, so it should be a good soybean crop. It intercepted 90%, almost 90% of the visible radiation. We can't do much better than that because when you put the seed in the ground, inevitably it's not covering the ground immediately. It takes time to cover the, the whole ground. So 90% is pretty remarkable. If we look at partitioning efficiency, how much of the biomass can end up in the part of the plant we care about? The seed of soybean. To achieve 60%, again, is remarkable because we're always going to have some roots, some stems, some leaves, left at the end. So these are the things that were improved during the Green Revolution. We're basically meeting the biological maximum. So we're left with one thing, and that's the conversion efficiency. If we look at what we achieve, then we may get about 3%. If we look at the theory, and this is really the process of photosynthesis, which we know in great detail, we can say from theory we should be achieving close to 10%, but we're only achieving in our best crops 3%. So can we do better? And if we improve that, do we really know we're going to increase yield? So this is an experiment. I think, Andrew, it's still just in place. It hasn't been dismantled. So this is the soy face experiment on our south farms. It's the largest experiment in the world of its type. And you can see these rings in the field. What we're doing in those rings is, for example, elevating carbon dioxide to simulate the atmosphere of 2050, to understand under farm-filled conditions, what will our crops do under those conditions? Carbon dioxide, though, is a limiting substrate for the process of photosynthesis. So if we add carbon dioxide, we get more photosynthesis. And indeed, when we do that in this experiment, we get 25% more photosynthesis. So if we can increase photosynthesis, will we get an increase in yield? And indeed, that's what we see. We see an increase in yield of about 16% in soybean, about 12% in rice, about 15% in wheat. So we know if we can boost photosynthesis, we can get more yield. So do we have to wait till 2050, or can we do something sooner? So, um, we think that we could engineer photosynthesis to achieve higher efficiency in crops. So why do we think this is timely, we could do this now? Um, first of all, photosynthesis is about the best known of all plant processes. Um, we have high performance computing, which we can use to, to essentially simulate the process in silico, to then optimize it and then say, well, of the millions of permutations we could make, which are the few which we should take forward to really doing in practice? Crop transformation through bioengineering um, is becoming increasingly routine, and so we can enact this in practice. Um, now, I mentioned this process of photorespiration, which can, we think, 
in our crop, for example, our soybean crops, our wheat crops in Illinois and the Midwest, is taking away thir about 30% of productivity due to photorespiration. These cyanobacteria, the ancestors of the chloroplasts in our crop plants, have a mechanism to concentrate CO2 internally, which prevents photorespiration. So one of the things we're looking at is, can we engineer that into the chloroplast to overcome photorespiration? Indeed, we, in a collaboration with the University of Nebraska, we've put a small part of this into soybean, and we've managed to get, um, in some field trials, not have, we haven't always been able to repeat it, we've been able to get over a 10% increase in seed per plant. So I mentioned our supercomputer capability here. What this has allowed us to do is to simulate every step of the photosynthetic process in silico and then use optimization routines to say, does the plant invest optimally for productivity? And the answer we get is that it doesn't invest optimally, and there are reasons for this. But we could tweak that to, to achieve it. And so what you see here is that the black is showing different proteins <coughs> and the amount we find within the, the leaf. The red is saying what it should be to be optimal. Now, one of those really <coughs> stuck out to us. It's not a very abundant protein. Yet the computer said there should be 10 times more than this to optimize productivity. So uh, a colleague of mine in England engineered um, this gene in tobacco. So she upregulated its expression. And you can see the plants, um, the wild type plants on one side, the engineered plants on the other. We then put those plants in our soy face experiment and we could see that increase in the field. So there are quite a few ways forward, and through different computational approaches, and Don ought to talk about this more tomorrow, we established, in theory, a number of ways in which you could get improvement in photosynthetic efficiency and sustainability. And so uh, the Gates Foundation fortunately read what was written, and with Lisa Ainsworth's help, we got, um, they got in contact with us and said, in the end, they said, well, we're prepared to put our money where your mouth is, and you can see whether you can execute this in practice. And we had our first field trials this summer, and I'm very pleased to say that two of them showed very significant changes. So just wanted to say a little bit about bioenergy, because, you know, obviously we're, we're short of land for food production, so if we're going to put bioenergy on there, we're going to perhaps have other problems. Now, I should just give you an idea of the potential. Brazil is the world leader, really, in its engagement with bioenergy, I think, to the opinion of most. This is some work that um, Chris Somerville and I did a while ago, looking at the 64 million hectares of land which um, Brazil has designated suitable for sugarcane expansion without conflict with its food production, without conflict with the Amazon region and so on. Um, we estimated rather crudely that um, Brazil's expansion could result in it very sustainably providing 15% of global liquid fuels. It would make it a Saudi Arabia of liquid fuel production. Uh, Deepak Jaiswal in our group has now investigated this in far more detail using IPCC climate change projections, but comes up with numbers which are actually quite close to these rather cruder calculations. Um, cellulosic ethanol, the conversion of basically straw or waste products from plants or dedicated biomass plants into ethanol has been happening. The Energy Biosciences Institute on this campus in Berkeley have been world leaders in developing that conversion technology. The first commercial plant in the United States opened on September the 2nd of this year. Um, 
I just skipped through these slides and not left myself enough time. But I mentioned we've also been, and Illinois really pioneered this work of looking at crops which could produce large amounts of biomass sustainably. And so we've really become a center for this crop. Um, Emily Heaton, pictured here, was the first graduate student in Illinois to really work on this crop. I've worked on it previously in Europe. But we've found growing it in Illinois, it's very productive, can produce 40 to 30 tons of dry matter per hectare. And it has this very nice growth pattern that in the spring it translocates nutrients into the shoot. In the fall it translocates those back to the roots. You harvest the biomass late autumn, uh, late fall and winter. The nutrients remain behind. This makes it very sustainable. So it's very productive but requires very few nutrients. So here it is being harvested on the south farms in the winter. We've conducted replicated trials across Illinois and now across the United States. And this just shows the pattern of growth. What you can see in this top graph is that it can produce on our south farms as much as 50 tons of dry matter per hectare. When you harvest it, it's decreased somewhat. It also puts a lot of biomass into the ground, so it's adding organic matter to the soil as well. Um, we are very proud of the yields we can get from our corn crops here, but actually miscanthus in side-by-side -side trials here produced 60% more biomass. The main reason for that was that what you can see in this, the black line shows you the sunlight available over the year. The white line shows you how much of that sunlight miscanthus captures. The red, how much maize captures. And what we see here is that miscanthus starts earlier. It can produce photosynthetically competent leaves earlier than our best corn crops, and it maintains those later into the fall. It's no more efficient than maize, but it just does it for longer through the growing season. And that allows it to get 60% more biomass. Now, from trials I was involved in in Europe, and now trials we've done here, Miscanthus does pretty well on poor land, as well as um, good land as well. It's far less sensitive to the soil type it um, encounters than most of our food crops. So this is it growing on very poor land in the west of Ireland. That's a 72 horsepower tractor there, so you can see even in the west of Ireland it's pretty productive. Um, and we've modelled um, where we think we could get high yields, and you can see, yes, it would do very well in the Midwest, but that land is obviously being used for many other things, but also do well in many parts of the country. The dark red tells you where to get the highest yields, where land is not being used for row crop production. This map shows you where we do have row crop production in the US. That's the brown area, primarily the Midwest, um, Mississippi Valley, um, some obviously the Central Valley of California. So there's a huge amount of land we're not actually using in production. So for a crop like Miscanthus, what impact would we need to meet the energy independence goal of 2030, replacing a third of all liquid fuel use by biofuels? How much land would we need for a crop like Miscanthus? Well, our 48 states, contiguous states, are about 1,000 million hectares. We use about 176 of that in row crops, so less than actually one-fifth. A hundred years ago, it would have been more like two-fifths, so a lot of land has dropped out of that production. This is how much land we have in Conservation Reserve Program. You know, so, so this big square is, is the land we use in, sorry, um, the land we're using for arable agriculture. This small one is what we've got for um, a conservation reserve program. This is how much we need for a crop like miscanthus. Of course, it doesn't have to be miscanthus. It could be something like agave. Sarah Davis, um, who is a postdoc here, is looking at 
this possibility. We have a lot of semi-arid land in the southwest. This crop can be grown without any irrigation, um, and it can be grown on land which is much of it of quite low value as well. Um, and of course we produce about 110 million tons of pulp and we're replacing our use of this with these devices um, although there's clearly one use that might not go away so quickly but, but we've certainly got that sustainable production of wood which could be used. Um, finally I just wanted to also mention we're involved in a project here where we're looking at engineering oil production into the stems of sorghum and sugarcane. Now you might say, well, why, why do that? The problem we have with biodiesel is that soy, which is our major source, really produces very little oil per hec acre or hectare of land, about a barrel of oil. And so even if we used our entire soy production, we wouldn't get very far. Whereas with Sugarcane, for example, um, if you could replace that sugar, the energy that's in sugar, with oil, then you could produce a large amount per um, acre of land. And so we've, through a stimulus project, we've been um, engineering this, and we've, this is a combined project with Brookhaven National Lab, Illinois, Nebraska, and Florida, and we've now managed to get to 5% oil in the stem. We believe we could get to 20%. Um, we've mapped out land where you could grow sugarcane, um, and the yellow there tells you marginal land. If you could grow a crop like this on that land, um, that would meet two-thirds of the ISA goal. And it would come in, we know how to crush sugarcane, we know how to extract oil, convert it through soybean. So economically, it's very easy to predict. That would come in at a wholesale price of $2.73 a gallon. So just finally, I, um, I had a long list of barriers here. I think what I'd say from a scientific perspective is we can have both. We can have more food yield. We can have renewable fuels. But there are a lot of barriers to those. And I'll point out the Haber process, which uses fossil fuels to make nitrogen fertilizer. Supposing that came in today, would society accept it? Fortunately, it came in 150 years ago. They were probably supporting 4 billion more people on this planet because of that one invention. And we're becoming very wary about accepting new technologies. The only reason we've kept ahead of the prediction that the world will starve is by a continual sequence of new technologies. And of course, today we're resisting genetically modified crops. But it's also it's not just our failure to communicate that genetically modified crops are actually much safer than the old technologies. We're not, not only are we not getting the message across the, to the public, but to politicians. So we've seen New laws come in recently in Florida and Mississippi which say that if you're growing a bioenergy crop, you must take out a $2 million bond against this crop becoming invasive. The legislation says, however, if you're growing the exact same crop for agriculture, you're exempt. Which shows a complete failure on our part to communicate what the biology is of a plant. You know that. The use doesn't make any difference as to whether it's invasive <laughs> or not. And with that, I'll um, finish and uh, put this slide up to thank a number of the people who've worked with me over the years to make this presentation possible. Thank you. Okay, Steve did an excellent job of, of staying to time there, so we have uh, five minutes for questions. And there are microphones up here at the front. Please feel free to come forward. 
while you're thinking about it, I'll pose one, Steve. So um, one of the challenges of obviously increasing crop productivity is the potential that the crops also need to use more water. Can you talk about how some of the targets in the right projects potentially increase carbon gain while also improving water use efficiency? Yes, this is certainly you know, quite, quite an issue. And in fact, you know, particularly in Illinois, most farms do not use irrigation. So because in the average year, it's simply not economic for a farmer to do that. And we've seen yields increase quite substantially in, in maize. And there's, there's discussion that we could get to an average yield of 240 bushels per acre. We're averaging about 180 today. What you see is when you, what, while we're increasing yield, we're increasing water use. And when you hit 240 bushels per acre, even in Illinois, you would now start to need irrigation to get any further. So we have been looking in the right project at how you might engineer this. One, one method is actually that cyanobacterial method I mentioned, that if you can eliminate photorespiration, you then um, lower the CO2 concentration inside the leaf. That allows you to drive more carbon dioxide into the leaf for the same amount of water loss. So that's kind of one technology we're looking at that would improve water use efficiency, but it is something which is really beginning to worry the community that you know, we've, we've managed to get these yield increases, particularly in corn, and we will hit a barrier. You know, So then we've got to really think, well, do we start to take more water from the Mississippi or do we say, okay, this is as far as we can take it? by decreasing the nitrogen, increasing the carbon. How significant of an issue do you think that is, and is that something that can be engineered uh, engineered out? I, I think probably and Andrew actually knows more about this question than I do, so maybe you should respond. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so there's been recent analysis that has shown that in C3 crops, uh, where you see an increase in yield, uh, you see a decrease in uh, protein content if they're non-legumes, and across all C3s you see a decrease in, in zinc and iron. Um, about 2 billion people in the world get a significant fraction of their zinc and iron from eating cereals, um, so a 5% reduction in the next 50 years in that in the bioavailability of those products would certainly be a challenge. I think the cause for optimism is that, at least in rice, uh, when we did that analysis, we found genetic variation in the response. So there's a potential target uh, for crop breeding or biotechnology to, to tackle that problem. Thank you. <laughs> this is going to be trouble. Steve, no, no. <laughs> I was, in, I was intrigued by the uh, performance um, targets for soybean that you put up. And uh, so we're maxing out light interception, but there's almost threefold potential for improvement in the conversion efficiency um, from yeah. the data that you showed. And I was just wondering, you know, in, in traditional breeding approaches, particularly historically, those selection for increased yields has been pretty agnostic about particular traits. And so why do you think it is in those breeding programs that have brought us to this point, we've not seen um, that gap close just because that trait for increased efficiency was carried along with other selection criteria for increasing yields? That, I mean, what I didn't say is there has been a slight, you know, there have been analyses of soybean and wheat, and they have shown a small increase in photosynthesis, but it's much smaller than all the other traits. And we think the basis of this is that, unlike, for example, disease resistance traits, photosynthesis is highly conserved. So the process in wheat is much the same as soybean and, and rice. We just don't see very much genetic variation, which is really why our only prospect to make, a, if you like, a large jump in photosynthesis is to use biotechnological approaches 
either systems or synthetic where we're introducing new genes or changing gene expression. Okay, well, I think to keep on schedule, we need to move on to the next talk, but please join me in thanking Steve for getting us, getting us off the boat. Illinois.